The title of our sermon this morning is Do You Love Christ? Comes in the form of a question. Do you love Christ? And we're in John chapter 14, looking now at this paragraph from verses 15 through 24. The Lord turning from his concern for the faith of his disciples now to their love for him. All of this to be an encouragement to them to persevere through the great trial they're about to face. The Puritan Thomas Vincent wrote these words in the 17th century. He said this, The life of Christianity consists very much in our love to Christ. Without love to Christ, we are as much without spiritual life as a carcass when the soul is fled from it is without natural life. Faith without love to Christ is a dead faith. And a Christian without love to Christ is a dead Christian, dead in sins and trespasses. Without love to Christ, we may have the name of Christians, but we are holy without the nature. We may have the form of godliness, but we are holy without the power. Give me thine heart is the language of God to all the children of men. And give me thy love is the language of Christ to all his disciples. Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you love Christ? Most of us in this room would undoubtedly answer yes to that question. But it's one thing to say that you love Christ. It's another thing altogether to actually love him. There have been periods of time in Christian history where to say that you love Christ would have immediately exposed you to fierce persecution, loss of family, loss of job, exile, prison, torture, beatings, the rack, burning at the stake, the loss of their life. That love which exposed them to such suffering was the same love that compelled them to it and the same love that sustained them through it. Our day is a little different. Most everyone you meet professes to love Christ. Unbelieving hordes of easy believism, nominal so-called Christians that cheapen and degrade what it means to actually love the Lord. There's no real commitment to the church, much less a commitment to suffer and die. They call themselves Christians and yet they are devoid of true love for the Lord. The Bible teaches that we have three deceiving enemies. A world system designed for the very purpose of enticing our love for the world. An adversary who lays before us an endless procession of temptations. And the most deceitful enemy of all, desperately wicked and closest to you, your own flesh. The seed of your own flesh, your sinful and wicked and deceitful heart. The human heart, consider the heart for a moment. The human heart, so deceptive, so duplicitous, so wicked, that God says, who can know it? And that question in Jeremiah 17 assumes an answer. No one can know it, but God and God alone. God alone sees the heart. God alone judges the heart. People are so easily deceived so easily influenced, so easily confused, so fickle, so unstable. Most people today, so easily deceived by their own heart, they don't even know their own mind. Much of the time, the only way to really understand what a person truly believes or thinks or feels is by looking at the practice of their life. That's a biblical principle. We see that throughout the scriptures, don't we? It's a fundamental teaching of the Bible. You will know them by their fruit. It presupposes that you can't know them through the profession of their heart. We're so prone to deceive ourselves and we're so prone to being deceived that whenever someone says, I love Christ, we have to ask the follow-up question. How do you know? How do you know you love Christ? What does the Bible say? How do you know? Where's your proof? Where's the evidence? Where's the fruit? What evidence is it currently producing in you? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? 
there are a great many errors, right, that have swept through the modern church. We see them on a regular basis. We talk about them. If you're out witnessing, you run into them on a regular basis. They've swept through the church like a cancerous leaven. The professing church today is a wreck, is a wreck. And we talk about them in our company here fairly often. And the reason we do that is a couple of reasons. One, we want to stay aware of those dangers. We want to expose them, be aware of them, so we avoid them. But secondly, it's to inform our evangelism. When we're talking to people. We want to help professing Christians who are caught in those errors. But the modern so-called church is doctrinally illiterate and lawless. You can believe virtually anything you want to, and you can do virtually anything you want to, and still call yourself a Christian. And churches will affirm that. And we talk about those things to expose them, as we should, but by the grace of God, we're not given to those errors. But think with me about what the Lord says of the last days. The Lord says this, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now that's what we have to be concerned with in this church. That's the danger that we're in. Because lawlessness abounds, the love of many will grow cold. By the grace of God, right? By the grace of God, our church is not in the danger, in any danger of some dominating heresy. We're not, we're not given over to lawlessness. We're not given over to easy believism. We're not given over to legalism. We're not given over to dead orthodoxy. We're not undermining biblical inerrancy. We're not undermining biblical authority here. We've not abandoned accountability. We've not abandoned church discipline. We've not abandoned a high commitment to follow Christ. Those are things that we hold to here. But let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. The Christian life, the Christian life is essentially dominated and motivated by a profound and enduring love for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a genuine Christian, if you're a genuine Christian, if you've turned from your sin and you're trusting him alone, then his love for you is settled. It's determined. It is infinite and unchangeable. The concern that we need to have is our love for him. Do you love Christ? Are you growing in your love for Christ? Or has your love for Christ grown stagnant? Has it grown dull or cold? How do you know? How are you to know? What does the evidence say? Many of you here this morning would be able to say with a clear conscience before God that your love for Christ is as fervent or more so as when you first set out. Amen? And I see it. I see it in you. There are some of you here this morning and your love has grown cold. Your love has grown cold and you've left your first love. Consider with me that your Christian life, our Christian life is to be defined by a profound love for the Lord Jesus Christ, a supreme love for the Lord Jesus Christ. That defines the life of a believer. Jesus said, listen, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Those relationships closest to us that under any or other circumstances would have supreme affection in our heart are those relationships that are subordinate to the love that we're to have for the Lord Jesus Christ. Love for Christ is to be preeminent. That defines the Christian life. We see that kind of love in the disciples who gave all to follow Christ, including their lives. We see that kind of love in Paul who said, what things were gained to me, these things I've counted loss for Christ. He counted them rubbish. We see that kind of love in Mary don't we? Mary, who broke the flask, poured out the costly oil, and wiped the Lord's feet with the hair of her head. 
We see that kind of love in the martyrs, in the martyrs through the centuries who have gone to the stake for Christ. But we rarely, we rarely see that kind of love, that kind of devotion in the church today. We have to acknowledge that, don't we? The love of many has grown cold. And if there's a danger we face in our church, it's that danger. That should be our concern. That's the danger that you and I face as a church. That's the danger that you and I face as Christians. Do you love Christ? Do you love Christ? The problem with many Christians is not that they have stopped loving the Lord Jesus Christ altogether, but that they have left their first love in pursuit of other priorities. That's the problem with most professing Christians today. If that describes you this morning, then it's likely that you sense that departure, don't you? You sense it. Your conscience accuses you. Let me give you some indications of it. Let me give you some symptoms of the disease. And it is 11. It's 11. Here's some symptoms. Spending time in prayer or spending time in the Bible is a burden rather than a delight. You're more concerned for worldly things than you are for the condition of your own soul. Does that grieve you? Your heart towards sin is cool, dull, or indifferent. You're not as sensitive to sin as you once were, right? You're not as grieved by sin as you once were. You've begun to compromise more and more with sin. Your heart toward the things of God, your heart toward the things of God has grown cold, cold or dull or indifferent. You're not as tender. You're not as tender to the things of God as you once were not as responsive to his word, not as eager to please him, right? not as eager to hear the word and apply it to your life. You don't hunger and thirst for righteousness the way that you once did. Your Christian life has degraded into a checklist of things to do. Your obedience, more motivated by the expectation of others, than by a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Your obedience more motivated by a sense of duty rather than by a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. You've become less and less concerned with fervent obedience to the Lord. You've become resentful or defensive about the demands of following Christ. You know what they are? And yet you fight and argue in your own mind and heart about them. The Lord is less and less on your conversation. He's less and less in your Facebook posts. Less and less on your mind, less and less in your thoughts. You've become more interested in leisure, more interested in entertainment than in serving Christ. You're more preoccupied with the sins of others than you are with your own sin. You rarely give rarely concern yourself with the needs of others. You seek to avoid sacrifice to give. You become less concerned for lost people, less concerned for the spread of the gospel. If any of these apply to you, be concerned for yourself. If any of these apply to you, it's an indication that you have left your first love. Do you see? That your love has grown cold. Let me give you one more. One more would be being less concerned than you should be about the items on this list that apply to you. To the church at Ephesus that left its first love, Jesus warned them in Revelation chapter 2 verse 5. He said, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now the church, the church gets to that point 
because people in the church get to that point. Do you see? To the Christian whose love has grown cold, the Lord warns, he that endures to the end will be saved. Do you love Christ? What's the condition of that love this morning? If you had to rate yourself on a scale of one to 10, (laughs) thinking about your fruit, thinking about your life, do you love Christ? Where would you rate yourself this morning? Where are you at? In John chapter 14, the Lord has been concerned with the faith of his disciples, right? The Lord is with the disciples in the upper room. They're on the eve of his arrest, the eve of his crucifixion. One among them has been identified as a traitor. He's told them that he will be arrested, that he's going to be tried. He's going to be beaten, scourged, mocked, and killed. So the disciples were rightfully fearful. They're confused, full of doubts. They're troubled. They're distressed, deeply disturbed in their spirit. They've given up everything to follow Christ and it appears as though now it's all crumbling around them and Christ is going to die. So he begins chapter 14 by encouraging them. Let not your heart be troubled in verse one. Believe in God, believe also in me. He wants to bolster their faith. He wants to bolster their faith to prepare them for the trial that lies ahead. He will depart and they are going to be persecuted. The sheep will be crucified and they will be scattered. And he says to them in chapter 14, trust me, the Lord says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Trust me. If you know me, you know my father also. He says to them, trust me, you're going to do great works, greater works than these you will do. And trust me, whatever you ask in my name, I'm going to do. Now then, if you think about this now with me, having expressed his love for them in a profound way, right? Washing their feet, the object lesson of washing their feet, and then commanding them to love one another the way that he just loved them, He now turns his attention to their love for him in verse 15. If you love me, he says, keep my commandments. Now their love for him, and I want you to see this in this passage, their love for him is the driving thought of the text. Look at verse 15. If you love me, you're gonna keep my commandments. In verse 16, if you love me, I'll pray the Father and he'll send another helper. In verse 18, if you love me, I'll not leave you orphans. In verse 19, the world won't see me, but if you love me, you will see me. And because I live, you will live also. Do you see how this thought permeates the text? Verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he's the one who loves me. Verse 21, the one who loves me, to that one I will manifest myself to him. All the way down through verse 24. Their love for him is the driving force behind the text. Now, consider with me this theme in its context. These disciples love the Lord Jesus Christ. That love to the Lord is expressed in the fact that they have left everything to follow him. They've been walking around Judea for the last three years. They've left family. They've left jobs. They've been persecuted. And now they've followed the Lord to Jerusalem expecting that they might die with him in Jerusalem. They love the Lord. That's how they express their love to him. Do you see? They love the Lord Jesus Christ, but they're on the brink of being without him. They're on the brink of facing tremendous difficulty. He's going to die. So now beginning in verse 15 then, put that in context. The Lord in verse 15 intends now to encourage them. He's encouraged them to express their faith and trust in him. And now he's going to encourage them and assure them based on their own love for him. Right? And I want to show you how that works in this text. If you love me, the Lord says, you're going to make it through the trial that you're about to face. If you love me, he tells them, you're going to have another helper. I'm going to pray the father and he's going to send another helper to you. Now, these are powerful guarantees powerful promises. And we're going to get into these promises over the next couple of weeks. All of them are meant for and given to the one who truly loves the Lord Jesus Christ. They are only for the one who truly loves the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ assures them that these are theirs if they love him. And we see the first of these promises right here in verse 15. 
If you love Christ, first on your notes, verse 15, you will persevere. You will persevere. You will make it. You will keep the faith. You won't fully and finally fall away, all right? Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now you say, verse 15, it sounds like a command, doesn't it? If you love me, keep my commandments. Where do we get the guarantee? Where do we get the promise here of perseverance? It's in that little verb, keep, right in the middle of the verse. That Greek word for keep is a future tense verb. Again, this is important when we study the Bible to look at specifics like this. Sometimes you got to study the knot hole on a tree to get the big picture, okay? And this is a knot hole on a tree, but it's an important knot hole, right? That little verb keep in the middle of the verse is a future tense verb, and that speaks of an ongoing reality for the believer. The sense of verse 15 then is this, listen, if you love me, you will keep on keeping my commandments. That's essentially what it's saying. If you love me, you will keep on keeping my commandments. Can you see how that's a promise? Can you see how it's a guarantee? Amen, right? The Lord Jesus Christ assuring them based on their love for him, you love me, and I know you love me. That son of perdition didn't. He's the son of his father, the devil. He's gone But the 11 that remain, you love me. And if you love me, you're going to make it. You're going to obey me. You're going to keep my word. You're going to keep my commandments. You're going to make it. Now that promise in verse 15 is conditional. It's based on the reality of their love for him. It's based on their love for him. If, if it's true that you love me, If you're a genuine Christian, in other words, then you will keep on keeping my commandments. You will persevere in obedience to my word. Now that's a promise. That's the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. If it's true that you love me, if you love me, if you're a genuine Christian, then you will keep on keeping my commandments. And it's a promise here that will encourage and assure these disciples who love the Lord. Think about this with me now. Because of that little conditional word, if, at the beginning of the statement, can you also see how this is a duty? It's both a promise and a duty. There's so many examples of this in the Bible. It is a promise of God and it's a duty. It's a responsibility of the believer. Can you see how we get both assurance then Assurance and exhortation. The promise assures us, gives us hope of our obedience, while at the same time, the sense of duty exhorts us to obey. Do you see? It's like Paul, if you're familiar with uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 14, Paul says in that letter to the Romans, he said, Sin will not have dominion over you. Think about that verse. That is both a promise, isn't it? and a duty. And what does that do in the life of the believer? Sin will not have dominion over you. So you, if you're a believer, you love the Lord, you say, amen, thank you, Lord. I'm fighting this sin, and it is beating me about the head and shoulders. I feel like I've been pushed into a corner, and I'm staggering, I'm getting my my teeth knocked out by this thing. But you've promised, Lord, that sin will not have dominion over me. So now think, Doesn't that promise then encourage you, the believer, to go out and fight sin? That's the effect that this should have. Listen, disciples, you're about to face a tremendous trial. It's going to be incredibly difficult. I'm leaving. Listen, when I leave, I'm going to send another helper to you. But listen, I'm leaving. You're going to be on your own, but you will make it. Do you love me? Right, you can think about Peter on the beach, can't you? Having denied the Lord three times and the Lord asking Peter on the, on the beach when he's restoring Peter to service, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know, I, Lord. I mean, haven't there been times in your life when you've thought about yourself in the shoes of Peter and the graciousness and the, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for Peter at that moment Restoring him, right? Mercy, grace, compassion, patience. 
Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And here, the Lord says to Peter, the one who's about to deny him, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. If you love me, you will keep on keeping my word. You will keep my commandments. That little word if there is also a duty. It should spur them on and it should spur you and I on to faithfulness and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like Paul saying in Romans 6, 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. Christ is about to leave them. He says to them, if you love me and you do, then you're going to keep my commandments. The genuine Christian says, amen. I will, Lord, thank you. Now, the reality of the promise of perseverance itself becomes a tremendous encouragement to our faith. A tremendous encouragement to persevere in the faith. Just like the promise of that sin, not having dominion over you, becomes a tremendous motivation to fight sin. Now what's required here, in both circumstances, what's required is the effort and the heart exerted in faith, right? That's the responsibility of the Christian. Effort, heart exerted in faith. Give the effort and the heart in faith and God guarantees the result. It's in that way that at the same time we think about the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints being the responsibility of the believer to persevere, we also have the simultaneous promise from God, from his word, that he, by his power, preserves us. It's a tremendous blessing, a tremendous encouragement. If this were all left up to us in our own strength, we'd be in despair. What hope would these disciples have in these circumstances if it was going to be totally left up to them? Peter's going to deny him three times. If Peter had to live for Christ in those circumstances apart from the Spirit of God, there's no way, no way that works. But God guarantees the result. Think about Philippians chapter 2, right? The Lord says, work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. You work it out. You put in the effort. You exert and exercise your faith in the Lord. Why? Why? Because it is God who is at work in you, both the will and the do according to his good pleasure. It's an awesome thought. If I go to work, God, it's God working in me. If I want to persevere in love for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to express my love for the Lord Jesus Christ in obedience to his word, I have the promise of God, the guarantee of scripture, that it is God by his spirit who is at work in me, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And his good pleasure is always good for me, right? It's a wonderful promise. So get out there, listen. Listen. Get out there and express your love for Christ and obey him and trust him with the results. It's God who is preserving you in obedience when you do. Now next, verse 15. Notice that this continue to be obedience in verse 15 flows out of love for Christ. He says in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, it's not simply raw duty. The Christian life is not simply raw. That's Islam, right? Or that's Mormonism. <laughs> it's not Christianity. The true Christian loves the Lord. The true Christian loves the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And their drive to obey, the motivation for the Christian to obey the Lord flows out of their love for him. Now, there are many who say they love the Lord who don't know him. You can't love what you don't know. That's why he follows it up here with keep my commandments. If you look down in the passage, keep my commandments, keep my commandments, then he switches. Keep my word, keep my words. It's all the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, in other words. You can't love what you don't know. We need to adhere to his word. We need to learn of him in his word. Now think about now, 
The drive to obey flows out of, is fueled by a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is John's definition of a genuine Christian. You're talking to someone, witnessing to someone, maybe you're examining yourself. John's definition of a genuine Christian is one who keeps on persevering in loving obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's John's definition. It's not my definition. I didn't sneak out and write that in your Bibles last night. It's John's definition of a genuine Christian, right? A Christian is one who loves Christ and obeys him in love. Look at verse 21. Verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, who's that, John? That's the one who loves me. And promise of God, he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. We'll look at that more next week. Look at verse 23. Verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Now, what about that one who says, I love you, but don't, he doesn't keep your word. There's no room for that one here. The reverse is also true. If you don't keep his word, you don't love him. This is not talking about Christians who love the Lord and Christians who do not love the Lord. Right? There's no such thing. This is cut and dry, black and white, one or the other. If you love the Lord, you're a genuine Christian. You don't love the Lord, you're not a Christian. Who is that one who loves him? That one who keeps his commandments. That one who is fervently from the heart obeying him in love. This is John's definition of a genuine Christian. Flip the page and look at John chapter 15 with me. And in chapter 15, drop down with me to verse 9. Verse 9. And here the Lord says again, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. And now he commands them, right? Abide in my love. Verse 10. How do we abide in his love? If you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The Lord Jesus Christ, when the Lord Jesus Christ obeyed the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't obey the Father in order to earn the Father's love. He had the Father's love, perfect inter-Trinitarian love within the Godhead, right? The Lord Jesus Christ obeyed the Father as his expression of love to the Father and in his expression of love through obedience, he abides in the Father's love to him. They abide perfectly in the Trinity, in love for one another, another through the Son's obedience, through the Father's good pleasure, through that perfect Trinitarian relationship. Now think about it, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Listen, if you abide in my love by keeping my commandments, your joy may be full. Now, let me apply this again to our circumstance here as we're talking through these texts. Is your joy as full in Christ today as when you first set out? If it's not, you need to love the Lord your God. You need to love the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you do that? By keeping his commandments from the heart, delighting in him and delighting in them. These things I've spoken to you. He says, if you keep my commandments, you're gonna abide in my love. Why do you say that, Lord? So that my joy may, be, may remain in you and your joy may be full. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another now as I also have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You're my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all things that I heard from my father I've made known to you. He doesn't simply give us the duty, say my way or the highway. He says jump, you say how high. He gives you all the glorious reasons why all these beautiful motivations, right? The love of the Father, the love of the Son, all that Christ has done for us. He says, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. 
These things I command you, that you love one another. Look with me, flip the page to uh, 1 John. Let's look at another epistle of John here. We're gonna look in John's writings. Essentially, at John's definition here of what it looks like to be a genuine Christian. There's so much error today, so much deceit. We have to know these things. And listen, if we think that you know, we're in this little blessed oasis, right, in this church. I love this church. This little blessed watering hole, this little outpost, right, of heaven. And we're worshiping the Lord here. We're loving one another. We're loving the Lord, loving his word. If we think that this little church, in the midst of all this error, if we think that all that can't influence our thinking, we need to take heed lest we fall. All that stuff, our culture, the culture of evangelicalism, the culture of church around us, the professing church, can influence the way that we think. We must be driven back to the word of God. We have to define our theology and practice our theology according to what scripture says. We do that, we have a sure guide, a rock that cannot be moved. We need to stick close to the Bible. First John, look at chapter two, one example. Loving obedience to his commandments, obeying his commands out of love for Christ. Look at verse three, chapter two, verse three. Now by this, we know that we know him. You could say by this, we know that we love him because of John's other teaching, right? By this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. You stop and ask yourself for a moment. If you're thinking through this, well, what commandments? All of them. What does the Lord ask of you? What does the Lord demand of us in his word? What has he commanded? When the genuine believer who has the Holy Spirit indwelling them hears a command given in the word of God, the desire of a true Christian, the desire of the heart of a genuine Christian is to love the Lord Jesus Christ by obeying that which he has commanded. I hear a commandment and I'm like, thank you, Lord. I'm, by your grace and by your help, by your spirit, I'm gonna obey that thing. I'm going to turn from my sin. I'm going to turn from my neglect. I'm going to repent of that. And I'm going to obey you in that area. And so when the Lord says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord, what do you do? Ladies, you submit with joy as unto the Lord. Knowing that your submission is not only to your husband, but to the Lord who has commanded it. Out of love for Christ, you do that. Men, when the Bible tells you to sacrificially love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, what do you do? You, for, for the love of Christ, you obey that command and you love your wife. When the Bible says that the word of God is to be your delight, you're to delight in it and you are to meditate in it day and night, what do you do? If you're that one, I think about this. I was witnessing a guy not long ago and I asked him, so what's your relationship to the word of God? Do you read it? No, never read it. I think about why that is. I don't have time. I do other things. Too busy. I've got work. No, it's because you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't love the Lord. If you loved the Lord and you found the Lord in the pages of scripture, you'd be in your Bible. I've got to know him. I want to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Really simple, right? Flip the page and look at 1 John chapter 5. John can't be any clearer about these things. And yet, people just, it's as if 1 John is not in their Bibles. <laughs> just going to ignore these passages of scripture. That's just your interpretation. Listen, there's no other way to interpret that. You either have to throw it out or you have to obey it. <laughs> so what do they do? They throw it out. 1 John chapter 5, look at verse 1. Well, look at this from 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him also be, uh, who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when? 
when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. If you remember from Galatians chapter five, verse six, circumcision or uncircumcision means nothing. What matters? Faith working through what? You remember the text? Faith working through love. Faith working through love. We're to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say, um, let's say that I go to my wife. I love my wife. I go to my wife one night and I ask my wife, Karen, must I kiss you goodnight tonight? <laughs> okay. Her answer is going to be, well, of course you must, but not that kind of must. You see? Of course you must, but not that kind of must. In other words, what she's saying in response to the question is, unless a natural and overflowing affection from my heart motivates me to kiss her goodnight, my kiss isn't appreciated. <laughs> my kiss isn't really, do you see? Don't bother, she would say to me if I approach her that way. <laughs> She'd rather kiss a porcupine. Worship is a must, right? Obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ is a must. Evangelism is a must. Reading your Bible, a must. Prayer, it's a must. All of these things are must. Loving your brothers, a must but never that kind of must. Do you see the difference? It doesn't work in kissing and it doesn't work in worship either. <laughs> There's no truth in it. There's no understanding in it. There's no overflow of affection in your heart for it. God essentially says in his word, don't bother. Jesus Christ rebukes that kind of worship, rebukes that kind of obedience when he condemns false, Israel, uh, false worship in Israel by saying, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. There's no affection in it. There's no significance. If you don't delight in the Lord, and if you don't delight in his commandments, if his commandments are a burden to you, now should you obey the Lord? Yes, all the time. But if you don't love the Lord, if there's no affection for the Lord, if there's no delight in the Lord, the Lord rebukes that kind of approach to him. Now, the Lord also, think about it with me, he rebukes that kind of approach, that kind of must. He rebukes that, but he also rebukes the opposite. He rebukes the empty sentimentalism he rebukes the sappy kind of love. I love the Lord Jesus. You show up and you raise your hands and I love him, I love him, I sense he's with me. And then you don't obey any of his commandments. He rejects that also. He says in verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He rejects both of those polar opposites, both of those extremes. You are to obey the Lord Jesus Christ and you are to obey him in love. It is to be your delight. Now, incidentally, it's commandments here in verse 15. You're to obey his commandments. You're to keep his commandments. It's commandments in verse 21, right? But it's also my word in verse 23. It's my words in verse 24. This means essentially keeping both all the commandments of God, all the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ, and his teaching, adhering to his teaching. You know, it's keeping all the commandments and adhering to the doctrine. Um, most places today want to do away with doctrine. You do away with doctrine, you do away with Christi Christianity. Most churches don't teach doctrine. They don't teach the Bible. They don't teach the Christian faith. Sometimes it's what someone denies later that proves they're not a Christian, right? You must adhere to his commandments and here, adhere to his teaching, to his words. 
I was talking to a guy one time, says that he got saved, right? Witnessing to him, says he got saved years ago, was following the Lord. And then after a period of time, after a period of years, he got connected with another guy that started whispering in his ear. And before you know it, this brother, he thought, denied the Trinity. What he denied later proved that he was an apostate. He was never a Christian to begin with. You must adhere to both his commandments and to his word, to the doctrine. Let me ask you again, how do you know if you're a genuine Christian? We've just spent time unpacking this one power-packed little verse. How do you know if you're a genuine Christian? Do you know that you're a genuine Christian? Because at some point in your life, you made a decision. You made a profession of faith. You prayed a prayer. You walked an aisle. Is that how you know that you're a genuine Christian? Because you were sincere when you did it? No. There are many, there are many who will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, who will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But Lord, haven't we done all these things in your name? Didn't I make that profession? If I made it once, I made it a hundred times just so I could be sure. And I meant it, Lord, every time. They prophesied in his name. They cast out demons in his name. They did many wonders in his name. And he said to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. That profession is empty. It is a sham apart from the love of Christ in your heart in obedience to his commands. You know, decisional regeneration, that whole scheme, that whole method of presenting the gospel and inviting people to respond to the gospel has filled the professing church with false converts. Filled the church with people who practice lawlessness, who do not love the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you know they don't love him? Because they don't keep his commandments. They don't hunger and thirst for his word, hunger and thirst for righteousness. The genuine Christian, the genuine Christian is known by his loving obedience. Now, next, think with me. Can you also see how this love is also the motivation for obedience? Also now, our, obedi our obedience is how we love Christ. Think about Verse 15, love for Christ is the motivation for obedience, but our obedience is how we love Christ. You've got to put both of those things together in your mind. Both of those things are true. It's a definition of biblical love. Think about this definition of biblical love. The word here is agapao. Agapao is a strong, non-sexual affection for a person and their good. You love this person for their good. You have their good in heart. You have their good as your desire. And that good understood by God's character, right? That love, this kind of love, especially characterized in scripture by a willing forfeiture of your rights or your desires or your privileges on their behalf. In other words, if I want to love my brother, I relinquish my desires. I forfeit my rights to love my brother. That's how I show love to my brother. If you're going to love the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you do? You lay down your life. You don't rule your life anymore. You don't live for yourself. You put all of that aside. You abandon that course. You turn from that sin and you abandon yourself wholeheartedly to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a forfeiture of who you are for all that he is and all that he's done for you. That's the way the, the Bible describes this kind of love. It is a love that obeys. It's a love that sacrifices. It's conveyed by their statement to the Lord. They've left all to follow him. They've left all to follow him. As we come to know him, as we come to more intimately understand, right, what he's done for us in the gospel, our love for him grows. Our love for him grows. And that love motivates more and more obedience. But also, if we want to demonstrate love for the Lord Jesus Christ, we demonstrate our love to the Lord Jesus Christ by obeying him. If you're here today, and you're listening to this, right? 
maybe you're not where you want to be. I'm not where I want to be. That, most of us are not going to be where we want to be in the Christian life. But if you love the Lord, you're thinking to yourself, this is how I express my love to the Lord. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. It means I want from the heart to obey him. Think about Paul's statement to Timothy in 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2 with a hardworking farmer, right? The soldier who his sole desire is to please him who enlisted him. We're to love the Lord that way. How do we know that we love the Lord? Certainly through our affections, our affections, but most certainly through those affections at work in our obedience. In this then, right, you can see how this love for Christ is both a duty and a delight. The commands of God are both a duty and a delight. It's not an either or, it's a both and. They're both duties and delight. If you've grown cold in your walk with the Lord, as we began this morning and we went through that list of symptoms of the disease, if those symptoms apply to you, if you thought to yourself, yeah, there's several of those. There's several of those that apply to me. You have to love the Lord Jesus Christ more. He is infinitely lovable. <laughs> infinitely lovely. It may be that you don't know him well enough or you have forgotten, right? The, the hymn has said, we are prone to wander. Lord, how I feel it. Prone to wander. If you have grown cold, love him more. If you want to love him more, know him more. Spend time pursuing him in the word. Spend time meditating on all that he's done for us in the gospel. How he took you, a wretched, hell-bound, hell-deserving, wrath-deserving sinner, and he made you a child in the family of God. Saved you from that wretched, eternal torment to make you a co-heir with himself? Draw near to him, the Bible says, and he will draw near to you. You have to obey him and delight in, in obedience to him. If you've grown cold, think about it, in evangelism. If you've grown cold in evangelism, you need to love Christ more. You need to love Christ. You don't love Christ enough if you've grown cold in your evangelism. You're not loving him as you should. What about in prayer? Right, we go through periods of time, the Christian does, in their prayer life, where you feel as though your prayers are hitting a, hitting a ceiling. Maybe you're not spending the time. You're getting in little fleeting moments in the car, in the shower, you know, right before you fall asleep 30 seconds after your head hits the pillow. But that's not enriching, worshipful communion with God. And so your, your prayer life is dried up. You feel cold. You feel dull, indifferent. Love the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to love him more. Love him more. How do you love him more in prayer? You spend time in prayer. You set aside time. You meditate on his word and you pray the Bible to him. You love the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. What about your Bible reading? Just can't maintain a consistent devotional time. Can't cons maintain a consistent time in his word. You need to love the Lord Jesus Christ more. You need to love the Lord Jesus Christ more. Love the Lord more. And some of you are cold. And you know this. You know that you're cold because you've not made progress. Well, listen, the Lord is gracious to us in all these things that when you obey him out of love, the Lord sanctifies you through your obedience. The Lord grows you and matures you through your commitment to his word, through your commitment to his commands. If you are in the Lord, you're loving the Lord and obeying him, you will make progress. You will grow. You need to love the Lord Jesus Christ more. The danger is, the danger is, one, being in that condition. You need to acknowledge it. You need to repent. And you need to love the Lord your God. Love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, heart soul, mind, and strength. The danger is being in that position and being content in that position, not doing anything about it. 
and week after week, month after month just rolls by, year after year rolls by. And he says to you one day, there are many who say to me, Lord, Lord, who will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That profession is a sham profession apart from heartfelt, loving obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a fruit of genuine saving faith. Amen? The opposite of verse 15, the opposite of verse 15 is also very true, very urgent, very critical, and very damning. Verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. If you take the question that began this sermon, do you love Christ? And you look at your life and looking at your life, you see a persistent pattern of disobedience. Then verse 24 applies to you. He who does not love me, the thing that marks the unbeliever is a lack of love for Christ. How do we know that we don't love Christ? Because we don't keep his word. You can say you love Christ all day long, but what is the mark of the unbeliever? He doesn't keep my words. So brothers and sisters, we need to be, we need to be earnest. We need to be earnest in our love for the Lord. We need to be earnest in searching for him in his word knowing him from his word. We need to be earnest in prayer. We need to be in earnest in love for one another. And most importantly, we need to be earnest in our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to repent of my neglect. Don't you? Let's love the Lord Jesus Christ, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when we love the Lord that way, it shows up in the life. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for, for how your word searches us and tries us and convicts us. Lord, we need that. We need that because we are so prone to wander. Or we are so prone to apathy and indifference. We're so prone to a cold, dull, indifferent heart. We're so prone for our love for you to cool. And please forgive us for that wicked sin. You are worthy of hot devotion. You are worthy of our worship and our praise, worthy of our obedience. All that done in love, Lord, because you are infinitely lovely. And we are so grateful to you, God. Please help us to, by your spirit, help us to cultivate in our hearts a deep and profound love for you that expresses itself in joyful, delighting obedience to your commands. Help us, Lord, by your spirit to cultivate within us a deep love for you, Lord, that manifests itself, evidences itself in a, a growing appreciation, a growing knowledge, a growing love for your word. Lord, help us by the strength that your spirit supplies to, to devote ourselves wholly to these things. Forgive us, Lord, where worldly priorities force out or push out our supreme and preeminent priority. Convict us of that sin, Lord. Grant us repentance. And by your spirit, help us to live for you as we should. And we need you in this, Lord. We recognize that we are weak in the flesh, even though our mind is willing. And I pray, God, even as we consider these things now in this sermon, I pray that you'd protect us from walking out the front doors of this building going home, going to sleep tonight. And by the time the alarm clock goes off on Monday morning, all of this is just a distant memory. And we're right back to a putrid, weak excuse for devotion to you that we've been wallowing in for some time. God, please protect us from that. Help us, Lord, to stick in our hearts and in our minds. Help us, Lord, to repent now where we have failed in this 
Strengthen us by your spirit now, Lord, to take action in repentance to you in this. Take action in our faith in you. And to live heart, soul, mind, and strength for you. Again, Lord, you are worthy of these things. We know that's what your word teaches. Help us, Lord. Strengthen us by your spirit to apply it, to adhere to it. That Christ may be honored, may be exalted, may receive the reward of his sufferings, may be magnified. And that we would be glorious testimonies and trophies of his grace. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for all these things. In Jesus' name. Amen.